Chris, you are a quantum physicist and very uh, committed to the philosophy of Carl Jung. That seems an odd combination in today's world. Uh, Jungian ideas have a certain, well, metaphysical or um, uh, almost a non-physical aspect to them. Uh, how do you reconcile these two kinds of radically different ideas? Well, let me start by saying I can see a straight line that goes Plato, Kant, Jung. I believe that it all linked together. Uh, and I do think they have something to tell us as scientists, mainly perhaps cautionary warnings to us. I mean, Plato believed in Platonic forms, that being sort of abstract entities, universals that existed. That really existed. Yeah, we, oh, yes. In, Numbers, least, logic. That's right, yes, indeed. Um, yeah. Which appeals very much to mathematicians, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then we come to Kant, who talked about categories. So he thought we were obliged to talk about the world in certain categories because of necessity we use a certain type of Aristotelian logic, and therefore we could not help talk about certain categories. And he warned about using uh, categories in the wrong place. And I think modern scientists do it all the time, actually. Then we come to Carl Jung. He talked about archetypes, the collective unconscious. Now, an archetype was a, a certain mode of experience which we projected into the world. Um, so he believed that all of us of necessity will see the world in certain ways, or collections of ways, which are, if you like, related to the structure of our unconscious. Mm. Now that's a more psychological thing. It's not directly concerned with quantum mechanics, but nonetheless, there is a thread running between all these things, which is the warning. If you want to be an absolute realist and talk about things really existing, that actually we project into the world mm. a lot of these phenomena. Mm. And that had a big impact on me as a scientist. Mm. I began to think, well, actually, when we talk about things like space and time, the way we do, why actually do we do it that way? In particular, why do we use certain mathematical quantities and assume a priori that they're going to work? Mm. Um, physicists tend to believe, but maybe actually sensibly, if, it, if you've got something that works very well in one domain of discourse, why not say it applies to everything? Mm. That's, of course, a bit optimistic, but at least try and extend the barriers of it. That's fair enough as a scientific procedure, but as a way of understanding what is really real, if you like, it's a bit dodgy. Because for all you know, when you go to a new domain of discourse, um, the underlying structure may be very different. Mm. And because of this reason, I really began to think seriously about what mathematics we use in physics. And uh, the last 13 years of my work has been very much dominated by this thought. Now, I don't think I would ever started on this research program if I hadn't actually studied Carl Jung in some depth and also mm. Manuel Kant. Mm. Okay, let's look, let's look at some of those uh, things. Uh, uh, first of all, Plato, his, uh, his concept mm. that abstract objects are real or generally liked by mathematicians and uh, uh, not by philosophers and sometimes physicists. Let's look at the second category where Kant talked about categories and category mistakes. You said science um, is, uh, is particularly notorious for uh, misusing categories. What are some examples of that? Well, that's my personal belief. Of course, the scientists wouldn't agree with me. No, no, I, I, yeah, but give me, I'd like some... What? Well, a good example is um, the way in all of modern physics we describe things like space and time in terms of numbers. Mm. So we talk about a certain period of time after some origin of time, but we measure that or talk about that time in terms of a real number. So, for example, you may start a clock, then talk about the time at root two afterwards. You see. Mm -hmm. Now, root two is 1.414, etc. It never terminates. Right. So do you actually really believe that there's a root two time? Mm. It's not so obvious. Um, but it's convenient for scientific purposes to suppose that there is, because it works in Newtonian physics and it works in quantum physics. In other words, empirically, it works very well. So if you work for Intel, for example, you don't worry about these sorts of things. You make millions. <laughs> because that's one of the striking things about quantum physics, of course, is that it actually works incredibly well. And mm. People do make millions out of it, even though we don't really understand it. Are there other category mistakes in science? <laughs> I'm not saying there are mistakes. They're possible mistakes. Okay. Look at the basic paradigm we work with as physicists. On the one hand, you have space and time, and then you have things, and things manifest themselves to us in space and time. So from that point of view, if you think about it, ontologically, um, space and time are primary. They have to be there first, mm -hmm. and things appear in it. Mm -hmm. Now, Newton liked that idea. Leibniz famously didn't. Leibniz felt that in some ways, space and time were derived from things. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not our modern scientific paradigm, but nonetheless, it may well be at some level that becomes true. Now, there are a few people actually Picky ways of working quantum gravity would agree with me on this. Mm. Uh, so it may well be, for we know, that space and time themselves are derived categories. Mm -hmm. That time may be like temperature. You know, temperature for gas is a fine idea. 
But the, what it arises from is all the molecules dashing around. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at a very small area of the wall of a container of gas, of course, on average, you feel a certain pressure. But if you go very, very small, you see bang, 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 bang. So from that point of view, temperature is a derived category. Sure. It may be that time is too. Mm. And people have, some people have studied mm. uh, this sort mm. of thing. And that's an interesting idea. Mm. So those physicists are not making category errors. They're allowing for the possibility, at mm. least, that space and time may emerge. Mm. But many other programs in quantum gravity don't actually work like that. Uh, they somehow assume a priori that space and time are roughly in some way as we see them now. So that's perhaps an important possible category. Okay. Uh, let's go to the, the, the <coughs> third uh, philosopher, um, uh, Jung. And when, when you have these archetypes that you're projecting <coughs> onto the world as a physicist, is that is that a metaphor for understanding how we have a psychological process? Or is there some so, sort of a deep reality to these so-called archetypes? Uh, most people would tend to the former. Yeah, that's a fascinating question, that. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, from a practical point of view, right, if you're a psycho psychoanalyst, uh, you would say, well, it's an empirical observation, Jung made, that in talking to his many, many patients over the years, he thought he observed certain categories of speech, of presentation of the world, and he classified these and called them archetypes. And he believed they were unconsciously projected by us into the world. Now, but somehow all related to each other, some deep Well, he thought it was a common reality. thing, yes. Yeah. So all, all human beings would, would have these. Kind of plugged uh, into that. In some way, yes. Hardwired, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Which is a strange concept for a physicist to, uh, to at least uh, uh, entertain. Yes. Well, you could say, yes. I mean, I don't know, it's not really. I mean, you always say archetypes are psychological animals of instincts. We talk, I don't mind talking about instincts as a physicist. Yeah, sure. Can't go to sex and so on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so Jung has these ideas. Uh, now, if you're not a, if you're a Jungian analyst, I have many friends who are Jungian analysts, they believe this is a helpful way of treating people with real problems, mm -hmm. who want to develop themselves. If you're a Freudian, of course, you don't you think it's a lot of rubbish, so fair enough. I don't want to get in that debate. <laughs> the deeper question, however, which you ask is whether there is in the Jungian metaphysics some implication of some bigger order. Yes. Now, Jung himself believes so. Some of his latter work, which is fascinating to read, I have to say, he did believe that space and time themselves, for example, were really products of the unconscious. So our perceptions of space and time mm. somehow came from within us. Mm. Now that's going back to idealism, of course, as a category of thought. Uh, for example, when he talked about synchronicity and things like that, he believed that was what it worked. Very synchronicity good. meaning events mm -hmm. that 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 have a relationship to each other in for in appearance, but have absolutely no apparent ca Causal. causation. <clears throat> that's right. Between them, yeah. Of course, quantum entanglement was like that, but that's not still <laughs> Yeah, so, so you talked about that. Now, whether or not that is a physicist, I can really believe that. Well, I I don't know is the answer. I'm happy to say I don't know. But most of my colleagues will say, no, it's obviously it's nonsense. Right. Um, maybe it's not nonsense. And I think, I sometimes wonder, you know, as scientists, physicists, if you've got it completely wrong. Um, I like to think this, actually, we've got it totally wrong. That really we should start with mind as the primary category, inner experience, and accept that the fact that the world is somehow, is a creation of ourselves. Now, that's not a, you're not, it's not a trade union for a physicist, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> but maybe it's the case, I don't know. It's worth thinking about sometimes.